I'm an independent curator and uh, writer and translator based here in New York City. And um, yeah, most of my work uh, focuses on uh, perhaps Latin America on some side, but also uh, working with um, marginalized communities, um, spaces that aren't usually looked at, and uh, working with artists, uh, hopefully to kind of contextualize them across generations. My name is Fabio Marcaccio. I am a painter. Um, I'm, a, I'm originally from Argentina, and I've been living here more than 30 years, believe it or not. Uh, I basically work on, uh, on trying to redefine painting the digital age. So um, I actually uh, use a lot of uh, technology in my work. And um, I've been, uh, you know, lately I've been interested in, in the possibility of the new plasticities of 3D printing uh, to, to develop new ideas in painting. So um, that's about it. Hi, my name's Susan Luss, and I'm a visual artist. I, my, recently, I graduated from the School of Visual Arts with my Master of Fine Arts. Um, I'm currently working in a studio in East Williamsburg. And primarily, I work with found material, um, but I also incorporate canvas, which recently I've sort of learned is a really important material for me to use. And my work tends to be installation-based, but it works with the ideas behind painting, drawing, sculpture. Um, and maybe, you know, I'm learning a little bit about how performative uh, performance kind of works in my work, but sort of in the background as opposed to in the front of everything. It's more of the private part as opposed to the public part. Uh, my name is Sarah Trigg, and uh, I'm a painter and sculptor, and I have um, sort of an, a little bit of an unusual practice because I also um, do um, photography and writing uh, about other artists. And um, <clears throat> my trajectory through, uh, I've been in New York since 1996 and started as a painter. Um, and was making these, um, my, my work has always involved a landscape in some way. Um, and so I would, I had this series from like, 2000, like 2005 to 2008 where I would um, pick a calendar date and uh, look in the news and collect all the events that um, involved the landscape, whether it would be like a bomb going off or something simple about California wineries or, you know, just anything that might evoke an image of the landscape. And I would compile that imagery together and print it out, um, you know, print it from the internet and would generate sort of this surreal looking landscape of like what our sort of landscape is now. Um, in that you know we are hearing all this information now you know every minute you look down and pick up your phone and you know of a bomb going off in London or whatever it is. So um, I through collecting imagery like that for a long period of time um, I had you know in my studio I have binders and binders of, of these images and it naturally kind of fell into um, into abstraction and then right when that happened, uh, sort of the crash happened in the art world and the world in general. <laughs> and uh, galleries were closing. You know, my day jobs were in publishing, and I had this idea of, um, I just, just felt inspired to collect or to study and, and look into the things that artists collect and uh, their daily rituals in the studio surrounding their practice. and their makeshift tools um, and residue left over from their process and stories that about their own studio space that they interact with. And that became um, a book project that I ended up working on for four years. And so I unintentionally stepped outside of my studio practice for a, a longer bit of time than I expected to. <laughs> and. Uh, have kind of recent, you know, just in the past couple of years, have returned and it shook everything up and changed my practice quite a bit. Um, and so now it's uh, fully abstract, um, 
uh, and very process oriented, uh, I would say. And um, a lot of the, the uh, I shot 200 artists for my project across the United States. And, um, and actually a little bit in Argentina as that happens because my sister lives there, um, but not for the book. But um, inevitably, meeting and talking to that many artists really um, had a profound um, impact on my work. So, anyway. <laughs> um, thank you. My name is uh, Alex Jovanovic. Uh, I'm an artist. I work across a variety of media. I've been working exclusively in black and white for the last nine years. Uh, I live in the Bronx. I'm an art critic and I'm also an, uh, an associate editor at artforum.com. It's always kind of difficult to present uh, you know, what you do in, uh, in a short time, actually. Uh, I, and I always think that there is always this factor of, uh, okay, you are in your own world, and then you have to translate yourself. Uh, and that actually takes a lot of, uh, a lot of work, I think. And I, 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 sort of to that, you know, on that note, it also, I mean, it takes the work, but it kind of cha it happens over time too, in a way. I mean, it reveals itself, and you know, where this conversation is kind of about juxtapositions, and I'm like, okay, juxtapositions. I, you know, if you look that word up, it's very simple. It's relationships, the relationship between things that are next to each other, and um, you know, it sort of got me thinking about that in my studio, and that is like in a way my work, like the relationship of the materials, the relationship of me to those materials, the relationship of the viewer to all of that. So, I mean, I don't know how that works like in your work as a curator, like how that, you know, operates in your... Well, I think there are different aspects that um, are always considered and reconsidered when putting, a, putting an exhibition together. Um, I think one of the... One of the simple things for me um, is to think about just how people will walk through a space, how the um, work guides, where the eye goes, and um, to really use that to heighten some of the relationships that there are. Um, for instance, architectural relationships. Uh, in one of the shows um, that I co-curated called Bigger Than Shadows, uh, there was a work by Rico Gatson uh, called Untitled Nat Turner. That was this um, kind of hard edge, um, almost like infinite space kind of abstract painting um, that had a relationship with the stairwell, the wrought iron st stairwell that there was in this gallery where the uh, exhibition was. And there was no other place in the gallery where this piece could go but right next to it. And the relationship that it has, just because of the, um, just the way that the iron was built out and the work like speak to each other. And it's, and it's one of those um, where perhaps the, there isn't sufficient contrast, but there's such different objects that the relationship is heightened and you start to kind of look at the details of what's in there. So I think that's an interesting juxtaposition when you're just doing um, straight up visuals and spatial scale um, relationships. And I think there's a lot of scale and what Fabian does. Well, I was thinking about just a position because I always feel uncomfortable with the idea of uh, collage, just a position, or like a putting things together, you know, because I, in my point of view, I think it's a little bit the, the, the language of the 20th century, you know, the, the, the collapse, the war, the, the kind of the, the atomic era kind of situation. To me, the more interesting, I'm more identified with words like grasp or merging, you know, things that will be more of an organic nature. Actually, one of my, my big problems with painting is that it is like everything or nothing, like a all together, all uh, syncretic right in front of you. And most of other mediums like music and and uh, let's say film, have this sort of way of giving it to you slowly. And that's why I did actually my environmental paintings, actually, because there were paintings that you could never see all together. They were like murals, architecto, I would say painting, film, static film, architecture. So you will actually 
go, uh, go through the pieces. You will not see the painting, but you actually, the painting will make you walk. So you will be with the painting for a while. So you will kind of merge with it. One thing that's really changed for me post book is that uh, the process is kind of, instead of making like one painting, prior it was like, okay, I had this canvas, everything fits within these four, you know, sides. Um, and it's, you know, the painting's like a window, or it's like you're immediately saying like, okay, imagine this and walk into this. And now the work has got, gotten more object oriented, but it's, it's, it's in the studio, it is, I am waiting for those juxtapositions to happen on their own. Like it's sort of um, something sitting next to each other, you know, is what makes me think like, okay, oh, that's the next step for this piece and I'll do that thing over there and I'll wait for, there's a million sort of juxtapositions that are going on that I'm not forcing and they're just sort of having a dialogue and then I'm just there to assist to be the human that puts those things together, I guess. Well, it's also about making contrast, too, you know, about putting something next to something else in order to ignite something. How specific is that description? <laughs> but, um, you know, I think we all do that as artists. I think yeah. it's sort of an unavoidable fact of being an artist. And certainly living, too, you juxtapose one day next to the other. You juxtapose this experience next to the other. Um, it's such a funny, broad theme, I think. You know, I kept thinking, and it's strangely difficult, too, because, it's, you know, this act of placing something next to the other and, and what's the expectation from that? Obviously, you want some kind of, like, spark to come out of it, right? But, um, I mean, the way I like thinking about my work and the way it sort of exists in the world is that, you know, it's something that could very easily blend into the background, but, you know, if you have a sharp enough eye, you can sort of see, highlight, oh, yeah, it's that thing right there. Mm -hmm. You know, and if you sort of, like, let it into you, um, it does things to you. <laughs> sort of like a little drug or sort of <laughs> something like that. It got me thinking about chemistry, actually, in a weird way that, like, so, like, if you have, you know, two atoms that get put into a fluid, you know, then you have, they become ions, right? Mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. You know? And then all of a sudden something else can happen in that space, you know, when those two things are together, like other, other molecules can be born out of that, right. in a sense. I, yeah, I, I always feel that um, more chemistry or, like, alchemy have more to do with like some kind of merging of two substances, like for instance, the basic paint. You know, I'm a painter, so I always think, I always, I always say that I'm, I, I'm, I actually try to pay attention to more to the wet thinking of painting. And for instance, writers to me, people who work with words are more aerial, you know, they just, you use the air and the sound of the words go through. But with paint, you got this sort of a stone that are pretty much pounder pigments into a liquid all the time. I think language can be that way too, though. Yeah. I think language can be really messy. I think the thing, I mean, I used to be one of those writers who would like sit in front of a screen or sit in front of a typewriter and just like, you know, two hours would pass and a tear would fall from your eye and nothing <laughs> would happen. And then there's this other, on the other side of that is, is that kind of what a morass is? You know, we always think of like language as law, right? Like it's something that's always written in stone or it's something that defines, and it does in a lot of ways, I think, you know? I think that's kind of the beauty of being a visual artist is that you're always like slipping between the cracks a little bit or you're always sort of a leading meaning or a leading something that's going to pigeonhole you or trap you into a certain kind of context. But I think writing can do that too. Um, poetry, especially, I think it's yeah. probably the closest true. thing, closest thing yeah. perhaps to, um, you know, painting or something that's visual. And, you know, poetry, I think it's a bad rap too, because everyone thinks it's just purely aesthetic and it's just mm -hmm. pretty. And, you know, when I was a teenager, it's like poetry, fuck you, you know, that's not <laughs> punk rock, you know. Um, what a fool I was, obviously. Um, but poetry is this kind of very, well, like a painting can be a very uh, rigorous uh, accretion of decisions and, and time. So too can a poem, I think, as well. Well, this is, this is an interesting concept, the accretion of decisions um, that come through the work that the artists do. And um, 
I, I hope curators do as well. Um, and one of the questions that was put forth was, how does the world redefine intricacy? And I would like to reframe that as, well, how does the world redefine or how do we take on complexity? And I think the way you're talking about this kind of evolution in the work where bringing things together starts to create this kind of um, you know, different uh, mixture that becomes something else because of the mer an emergent mixture from the merging of things um, is more about kind of evolving your materials and practice and the objects that come out of it. And I think that's really interesting to me, like increasing complexity. Um, and in Fabian's work, what I've, what I've always appreciated is this, this kind of almost um, literal framework that comes from an image that's broken down in all these different levels into the, almost like the microscopic up to the large scale, uh, both brush strokes, um, which aren't even brush strokes anymore, they're like mm -hmm. silicon and they are plastic, and um, that there is this almost atomized stuff to the, uh, the image built up into these, um, into these structures, including even the work that um, Fabian was actually in a show that I curated in 2015 um, at Storefront 10 Ike called Repost. And um, I mean, the attempt was to have these paintings that were really structural and had uh, a connection between object and image. Um, and uh, Fabian's painting in that show was, was almost what you'd say was a banal pool scene. Um, from a distance, and then up close, you see these 3D printed elements, you see these large kind of strokes of silicon um, that look like brush strokes, and so you're always kind of flipping back and forth through, um, again, scale, I think, is important to me, and those contrasts um, that start to happen, so you're kind of in a, in a vibrant space, um, and those, those seem to me to add complexity without kind of overstimulating or, or destroying kind of the experience. So the, that complexity became apparent, though, as you moved towards the work. So it came more into focus that way, those kind of little I think details. So. Yeah. I think so. Because the way you described it, I was sort of visualizing being in that space and sort of looking at that work and standing back. And you know how when you stand back and then you go closer to something and it really brings it into focus? Yeah, and I think to a certain degree, the show was trying to, trying to posit that um, the image of the work has nothing of what the object truly is, mm -hmm. particularly when there seemed to be a, this kind of movement to make uh, paintings that were very screen friendly. Um, and there's almost nothing that you could draw out of seeing this image that came originally from an internet image mm -hmm. through seeing another image of it. Like you, you don't get a sense of the, of the object and the materiality. And that's it's quite interesting because I always have a feeling that uh, let's say, especially when you are in this, I mean, in any living situation, our sensors, I mean, the way how we see our peripheral vi vision, we have a drop of water getting into us. I mean, there is a smell. There is all these kind of things that, that really makes the, the sort of uh, feeling that we have. And that painting of the baiters, or oh, it was like a, a scene, it's almost like a, mi a mirage because it's, not, it's almost, I mean, you take a picture of it and you don't see, you don't have that feeling, the perfume, the Clorox of the water, I mean, all those kind of things. And that painting tried to do that, that kind of three-dimensionalization of, of that phenomena. Well, I want to get back to what you had said earlier about, you know, film or music being something that sort of draws you in, whereas painting is something that's more static. You know, once upon a time, paintings did do that. It did sort of seduce you in the way that a film would or that music would. But I think, you know, the 20th century, technology, yeah, contemporary right. life, all that stuff sort of stops us from doing like that. I would argue that painting still does. If you give it, because it's a, it's a different, right? It's something that's as old as time. And I think with that carries this great burden of history. And, and again, with that, you have to sort of you know, so much of like life and, and we're all sort of in this like massive entertainment complex, right? Where you sort of like sit in a movie theater, you have a big bucket of popcorn between your legs, it's all buttery and sticky and you're drinking some huge pop and then, you know, Tom Cruise is sitting there doing stuff to you, you know? And art has to have a different kind of, well, I think it has to have a different kind of relationship. There has to be some kind of seduction, right? There has to be some kind of, uh, you know, it just doesn't happen to you, you have to do to it. 
you know, there has to be a little bit of a foreplay <laughs> versus entertainment where it's just all kind of dumped on you yeah. a little bit. And there's a presence too that is quite interesting, I think, that it divides, because I always, I always say like, okay, why painting is still around? Why this or that is still around? Even opera, you know, like it's such a, a, a excruciating, uh, a specific thing. And they all have different places, I think, because, um, you know, what the, the way of how you tell a story in a film, you can never materialize it as you do it with a painting. And then you could never really get, probably with a painting, to the detail level of new photography and so on. So there are, you know, certain properties that are good for other mediums, even though that artists actually challenge those properties all the time. Sure. But I was getting at, like, just attempting to slow yourself down a little bit, you know, and something I hate too, and it's, I think it's just a very contemporary habit, I think we all have it as artists, is when you walk into a gallery and you just do that quick one, two minute scan and you walk out and you go to the next thing. And sometimes it's just really shitty work and you can't help but do that. But even that person who made all that shitty work, you know, something happened, there was a little bit of time, you know, making that whatever thing that's hanging on a wall or that video that you're looking at took some kind of effort and some kind of brain, there was a time lapse, you know, and we just kind of go in there and don't even give it, give it a second to like let it happen to us. So I think the lesson that I, for me, painting it, you, it forces you to slow down, if you choose to slow down, yeah. right? Yeah. And um, now I've lost my train of thought. <laughs> <laughs> you, we were actually just talking, entering before the conversation that sometimes people not even go to the shows, they oh, just no. see it, and they don't even see it, see it like in a good phone. computer yeah. screen, <laughs> like when I was younger, in the, let's say, 2000, early 2000, they see it in a, basically in the, in the That's iPhone. a lot of people buy art, you know? too. I remember who, how serious the photography was in, during the 90s of art photography, and now everybody takes snapshots, pretty much, so we live in this sort of forest of uh, snapshots. I wanted to, was thinking, this is back a, a bit ago when you were talking about, we were talking about the word juxtaposition and you were just talking about these words, these other words, marriage, marriage. and merging yeah. and whatnot. Well, grass. Hmm? I love Gra grass. Grass. You know, like when you grasp a, a botanic, it's a botanic term that they mm -hmm. put, let's say a citrus on, uh, like a, you choose to make a lemon, so you yeah. grasp yeah. the plant and then the orange or the lemon grows. It was the experience of the person with your work, as opposed to them looking at it, they're actually participating with it by the way you were describing them walking in. And I, I found, um, again, just recently, considering myself an emerging artist, I have, I'm older, I have life experience, but I don't have like art making experience, that, and I've just been really writing about it in the last like two weeks or the last week, is this idea of the person who's seeing your work somehow completing it or making it, it doesn't live in some way without that, you know, other person sort of seeing it. I can look at it, but it's not the same as someone seeing it in a way it's this revealing of you in a way. Um, and, I, and I found that kind of relationship of, and I'm curious how people see their work in relationship to the people who see their work. You know, if you, anyone could talk about like that. Oh, for sure. It's such a, I mean, especially, you know, that's why the studio visit is so important, especially, especially before it is seen by the public, too, because um, any artist or art professional is going to see some things, it's going to be a mirror to, to you to some degree and, and should, you know, bring up something that you might not even realize you're doing, yeah. right? That's what I've been writing a lot about, and I realize that that's every, you know, even like when you're probably curating or you're choosing work, maybe all of a sudden two things come together that you had these ideas, but then all of a sudden there's something new there. Like you're talking about Rico's work hanging in this one location. I think that if it becomes a forum, if it becomes like a, uh, let's say, the aim is a, is a, as a possible community, in a way. It's like a, how to somehow create something that could trigger things. Like a space. You know? One right. of the questions was exactly. like the space of, your, you know, where is your yeah. 
work operate? What space or, or you know, what are the spaces for you? Right. Yeah. And, and I think that this is, is quite interesting because the, um, the artists still push this, this idea of that, let's say, you could take for granted, let's say, when we are talking about, uh, okay, yeah, you can see art in an iPhone and things like that. But when you see something that really touches you and make you feel present, uh, that is a really magic moment, and it, 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 it somehow gets into your memory, and it's really part of your life. It's like you're living with that art. It's not like style or all these things. It's more like part of your life. I think there are a lot of sort of, I call them lifestyle conceptualists, you know, where everything's very, it's kind of lazy, you kind of, it's the kind of work you make on the way to the grocery store, and it's very Instagrammable, or it's very, it's easily digestible. And um, to a certain extent, I feel like <clears throat> maybe Instagram's the sort of uh, logical outcropping of all of that, you know, that it really isn't about the thing itself. Well, when I think about conceptualism, or at least like, you know, first generation conceptualism, I think about it as the artist is the magician, right? The artist is like the person who is incantatory who makes a spell and lo and behold, it's art.